This is David Harvey, and you're listening to the Anti-Capitalist Chronicles, a podcast that looks at capitalism through a Marxist lens. This podcast is made possible by Democracy at Work. Now, the equalization of the rate of uh, profit has the effects it does because of this contrast uh, between capital intensity and labor intensity. And that contrast, it seems to me, is something that needs to be uh, brought under control. And the way that it can be brought under control is by, by having the free movement of technological capacities and powers. Now, it is, I think, very interesting historically to see how the United States looked at uh, the transfer of technological understandings and technological skills from one part of the world to another uh, from the 1950s onwards. And from the 1950s onwards, the United States was terribly, terribly concerned uh, about China and the threat that Chinese communism and Soviet communism was going to pose uh, to the U.S. domination in the world. So one of the things that the, the U.S. set up was a policy of containment. And that policy of containment was about trying to support the revitalization of the Japanese economy, trying to support the South Korean economy, the Taiwanese economy, Hong Kong and Singapore, because then what you would have is a circle, uh, an arc of rich nations which were surrounding China. Now, the interesting thing uh, during this period was the, the, the United States did not put up any barrier to technology transfer to those countries. In fact, technology transfer was pretty open. Uh, and and therefore Japan could uh, take technologies from the United States, could develop those technologies in its own way, uh, so that we started to get the technological uh, wizardry of the of the Japanese. Uh, the same thing happened to the South Koreans. Same thing happened to Taiwan. Is the United States was effectively allowing those countries free access to technological information. And that free access, of course, allowed those countries to develop. So if you look at all of the countries and, and ask yourself the question, why was it that those Asian countries uh, became went from sort of low income uh, to middle income to upper middle income countries uh, over this 40 years period? Well, it had a lot to do uh, with the way in which the United States did not try to prevent uh, any kind of technology uh, any technology transfer. Now, along come the Chinese, and they're looking at the development trajectory of uh, Japan and Singapore and all the rest of it, and they start off with labor-intensive uh, uh, forms of industrialization. Uh, huge labor force, which was, could be mobilized and was mobilized, and of course, within 20 years, uh, China became, in effect, the workshop of the world, producing a vast array of goods, goods uh, which were uh, largely created through labor-intensive forms of uh, production. But uh, a number of things have happened uh, since then. The crisis of 2007, 2008 uh, undermined uh, the export of those goods to many parts of the world, and therefore China had to start to think about uh, making something different. It had to think about developing its own internal market uh, and, 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 and the like. Uh, and at the same time, uh, the effect of the one-child policy in China, which uh, had been rigorously enforced from the 1960s onwards, uh, that one-child uh, policy uh, meant that the, the surpluses of labor, which had been there in the 1980s and 1990s, were drying up, and you're beginning to get an aging population. And uh, so you suddenly find that the labor surpluses, which had been the foundation of labor-intensive industrialization, are no longer there. Wages in China started to rise up. Uh, a lot of uh, political unrest in working people in China. And, and of course, the, you have the Tiananmen Square, episode and the like and the Chinese I think understood that if they were going to maintain power uh, they had to actually try to buy off the support of large segments of the population by developing an internal form of consumerism and develop uh, an alternative uh, economic uh, base uh, 
And so they wanted to make the same transition that Japan had made earlier and South Korea made, that is to move from labor-intensive forms of production to capital-intensive forms of production through uh, technology. China has surpluses of capital and is starting to export those surpluses of capital. So if you look at a, at a, uh, at a map of uh, Chinese capital exports, it goes from almost nothing to uh, a huge amount of movement of capital out, particularly into Africa, uh, uh, but also uh, into other areas. I mean, one of the things the Chinese did was to start to acquire technology companies in northern, uh, in North America, technology companies in Europe, and use uh, the acquisition of those te technology companies to transfer uh, uh, intellectual property rights uh, to China. And of course, China had these rules about foreign investors when they came in. They, they could only come in if they partnered with the Chinese company and shared technology. So there's no question that China has been appropriating technological expertise from the West at the same time as it's been developing its own capacities to develop its own technological expertise. So China has actually resisted the equalization of the rate of profit and in fact, within China, the profit rate doesn't really matter so much as the mass matters. That because you're working with state-owned companies and because the state-owned enterprises uh, have a, a different structure to them and, and, and are less concerned with profitability because they can always be propped up by the state-owned banks, we now find uh, that... that uh, the Chinese situation uh, is is very is very different uh, from the rest of the world. That they have still a level of protection of their own economy, which doesn't exist elsewhere. Because although China has signed onto the WTO, it was given a grace period in which to uh, to adjust, and it's managed to sort of play around by saying, "Well, we've opened up, but now we haven't opened up." So there's a, 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 a lot of this going on. So here we have a situation in which the United States geopolitically is trying to prevent China from moving towards technological uh, and, and capital intensive modes of, 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 of production. And in, in so doing, it is invoking uh, intellectual property rights as being one of the big issues that is absolutely critical to the World Trade Organization structure. Now, what this says is intellectual property rights is actually enclosing the global commons and turning something which should be open to all, that is knowledge and, and understanding, into uh, a form of property, which then you need a license uh, to utilize. Uh, the United States has been sort of importing sophisticated uh, software engineers from India. In other words, in other words, and even a country like Britain, which has a, a pretty good uh, university structure, when th when people become very, very, very much involved in these technological innovations, they find themselves uh, lured to Silicon Valley or somewhere like that. So that actually we have what we call brain drains, if you like, where where the world's uh, intelligence is being increasingly uh, put into into one into one part of the, the world and the US has been at, at the lead of doing that and has done a very i think a very pretty good job of it the one place where, where it has been done also very fast is of course china and china has certain advantages of this first off you have a huge market in china and that huge market can allow artificial intelligence and uh, many of the other techniques which are being used to be tested out uh, in ways which is very difficult to do elsewhere. Secondly, the regulatory regime in China uh, is less uh, concerned about individual rights and all the rest of it, though we have seen, I think, uh, in uh, recent times how easy it's been really for capital uh, uh, and and uh, politically, if you like, as well, uh, to to avert uh, you know privacy laws almost entirely and get a tremendous amount of knowledge about what everybody is doing uh, from their credit card use and you know these smart data kind of uh, operations are, are all around us. So we have this 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 
situation where technology transfer is going to be, it seems to me, a big issue over the next few years. And how it works out is going to have, I think, an incredibly important role to play in economic development and, and the nature of the capitalist beast. Because to the degree that the United States succeeds in, in if you like, suppressing uh, and repressing uh, technological capacities in other parts of the world, you're likely to see a monopolization of that knowledge, and the monopolization of that knowledge is not uh, going to allow for free forms of, of growth. And what we're now headed into is uh, a technological impasse where the technological in uh, innovations are there and they're being made, but they cannot be applied because... Uh, freely applied because there is this barrier which is being set up to technological uh, and the application of technological innovation by uh, this system of intellectual property rights which the United States is trying to insist upon. But right now I think it's very important to look at this whole kind of question of labor intensity and capital intensity as two forms of the economy. Think about uh, the way in which uh, they are being deployed right now and Think about the question of technology transfer because the technological mix is a crucial uh, piece of the story as to what differentiates capital-intensive from labor-intensive economies and what's happening with that on the global stage is very much a contested area right now. So when we see Huawei being suppressed by and sanctions being put and all those kinds of things by the U.S., uh, the U.S. fighting with China over intellectual property rights with a fearsome way. I think that what, what you have to understand is what lies behind it is that advantage which flows uh, to the United States from maintaining itself as the capital-intensive economy and not allowing other economies to become uh, a, parallel, a, a parallel intensity with it. Uh, it did allow that to happen for geopolitical reasons with Japan and, and South Korea and Taiwan, uh, but uh, it's not allowing it anymore and it's hanging on to its privileges uh, by this whole kind of uh, corralling of intellectual property rights, which seems to me to be about enclosing the global commons of uh, the knowledge structures that humanity has available to it and turning that into commodities uh, which are controlled uh, by, by, uh, basically by, by the U.S. Now, it so happens that uh, the crisis of 2007-2008, which crashed the U.S. consumer market, also crashed the, U, the, the China export market. And so China went through this huge kind of readjustment uh, at, uh, around, that, around that time. Um, but the access to the U.S. consumer market never recovered. In other words, uh, the export industries accounted for, uh, I don't know, 20 or 30% of Chinese uh, GDP or something of that kind. Uh, before 2007, 2008. That was cut in half uh, during the crisis, but it's never revived back to its pre-crisis pre levels. So China is less and less dependent upon the U.S. consumer market. The big question then is, where is China going to find its alternative market? Uh, well, part of it is that China is, of course, exploring markets all around the world. And so if you look at the data on Chinese uh, penetration of foreign markets, you find uh, throughout Africa and increasingly in Latin America, uh, China has become a huge uh, so, sort of uh, supplier of consumer goods uh, to, those, uh, to those, those markets. So there has been a movement of that kind. But the big issue for China is, can you actually create an internal market? And the internal market has been very dynamic. But the internal market in China has been supported by a huge increase in credit creation. So that China is uh, in a difficult transition moment where it's also uh, going through a transition from labor-intensive forms of production uh, to capital-intensive forms of production. Now, one of the things which I have mentioned in previous uh, uh, podcasts is that 
labor-intensive industries uh, do not actually gain the benefit of their labor intensity because there is a transfer of value from labor-intensive industries to capital-intensive industries so that the capital-intensive centers of the world are those which actually end up, through free trade and the equalization of the profit rate, receiving more value than they actually produce. So there's a, a bias which exists within the capitalist system uh, which is actually a bias towards capital intensity. Now, China has been labor intensive. So in effect, labor intensity in China has been supporting the centers of capital intensity uh, so that there's been a subtle, if you like, transfer of value from China to the United States through the free market system and the equalization of the rate of, uh, of, of, of profit. So that structure is now going to be intervened in by China actually moving towards capital intensity, production. Now, here comes the interesting thing. Of course, capital-intensive forms of production depend upon high, te uh, high technology, depends upon uh, the, the kinds of technologies that Trump is saying uh, China has been stealing from the United States. But, but here's an interesting little piece of history. Um, Japan took... Chinese took uh, U.S. technologies in its industrialization. The United States did not object. And in fact, the, Chinese, the, the, the United States was encouraging Japan to take U.S. technologies. It encouraged South Korea to take U.S. technologies. It encouraged Taiwan to take U.S. technologies. It encouraged Singapore to take U.S. technologies. So the U.S. as a center of technological excellence was actually complicitous in the transfer of technology to all of those Asiatic countries. And there's an interesting question, why? The answer was China. U.S. was so fearful of China uh, and Chinese uh, development that it wanted to create an arc of containment of China so that China could not really compete. And so it allowed the technologies to flow to all of those countries so that you created an, an arc of capitalist development around China during the Maoist period, which would actually contain China. Now, this goes back to the uh, what happened after uh, the founding of the People's Republic of China and, you know, what, 70 years ago now, the 70th anniversary of that's just coming up. And what this what the response of the US was containment and that is you had to support the economies all around China so that China could not actually spread outwards and the only way you could contain them was by actually liberating the flow of of, of technology and and ideas to all of those all of those countries so that all of those countries became centers of innovation of their own right so you know taiwanese firms south korean firms so on you know we turn up and what do we see we see samsung we see all of these all these corporations which are asiatic corporations and the asiatic corporations uh, of course, have taken the technology from the United States and, and, and actually, to some degree, returned the technology to the United States because there's been a free flow, as it were, of, of, of technology. I mean, there were periods of argument and all the rest of it. But basically, uh, the U.S. was encouraging uh, all of those countries to move from, from, from labor-intensive uh, forms of production to uh, higher order so that uh, China, that none of them would be tempted to side with China. And China would not have any kind of credibility given its economic development with uh, any of those countries. What happens in China is to some degree going to be contingent upon what happens in the United States. And I think what happens to China is actually a critical thing for thinking about the future of humanity in terms of the environment and all of these other kinds of questions. And that therefore, where there should be a situation of negotiation with China about how, how its developmental practices and its development process uh, might work in a collaborative form, because the Chinese are capable of coming up with, collab with, with solutions to problems and, 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 and management structures for contradictions, which, which are way, way ahead of anything that exists here. I think that there's a serious issue here that we should not, under any circumstances, 
take this anti-China kind of position uh, automatically and start to work at it because conflict with China is not in the world's best interest right now. Thank you for joining me today. You've been listening to David Harvey's Anti-Capitalist Chronicles, a Democracy at Work production. A special thank you to the wonderful Patreon community for supporting this project.